Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first in a series of uh, HSS Virtually There Days uh, here at uh, sunny Oxfordbrooks University. My name's Joe, and I'm going to be presenting today, and I'm joined, it's a full house, by some of our esteemed academics and also one of our students. They're going to introduce uh, themselves uh, shortly, but before they do, please bear in mind that you have the opportunity to ask questions live uh, to the academics and the student who are present. You can do so just to the right-hand side of the screen uh, where you're watching. Um, you can also, uh, if you have any admissions questions, there is a live admissions chat going on right now until 1.30, so please direct any of those questions to admissions. As well, um, please take the time to take our virtual tour on our Virtually There Day website. Um, and uh, please, in, um, sorry, without further ado, we are going to introduce the uh, academics. But first of all, uh, Daniel to my left here is just going to give a brief overview of the Department of uh, English and Modern Languages. Hello everybody, yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel Lee. I am the Programme Lead for English Drama and Creative Writing. And what I'm going to do is just introduce the department. And we are a Department of English and Modern Languages, um, which means that we have a number of programmes which uh, we teach. And so what you'll see represented today is a number of those, those, those programmes. Uh, but we're a department of about 30 academic staff and we cover uh, English literature, uh, drama, we cover applied languages, French and Japanese. And uh, I'll hand back to Joe so he can introduce indiv individual members of the department. Thank you very much. Uh, so starting at the other end with our student, they're now all going to introduce themselves. Uh, hi, I'm Cheryl. I'm a PhD student in the English department. Hi, I'm Irene Hill. I'm the programme lead for Modern Languages, but uh, also the course uh, subject coordinator for Applied Languages. Hi, I'm Dr. Karina Bartleet. I'm the subject coordinator for Drama. Hi, I'm Hanako Fujino. I'm subject coordinator for Japanese Studies. Hi, I'm uh, Barbara Giraud, and I'm subject coordinator for French Studies. Uh, and I'm Daniel Lee, and I'm here to talk about any questions to do with English literature. Perfect. So um, we're going to start the questions now. So keep uh, get them flooding in. Um, um, the focus first is going to be on English literature. So back to Daniel. Can you tell me, please, or can you describe a typical weekly timetable for a student studying English literature? Sure. Uh, well, what normally would happen? It depends on the modules students take, but work on the principle that generally students will take four modules in a semester. So there's two semesters in each year, and you take four modules per semester. Uh, for each of those modules, you would be studying usually two to three hours per week. So the overall um, time in which students will spend in class is usually about 10 to 12 hours, depending upon the modules you'll take. Often students arrange the modules into, um, into sort of taught days, so they'll, be te they'll be usually be studying on, on um, three to four days a week, and they'll have one study day. For a subject like Eng English, um, the number of direct contact hours we're in class is relatively low because of all the reading that needs to be done alongside that. So there is a there's a, a lot of a lot of free time, a lot of time to actually do the study, be in the library, and to be uh, exploring the subject fully. Um, can you talk to us about teacher group sizes, please? What kind of size of groups will we? Sure. In this, it, we have a, a system whereby the the group sizes taper, so that in your first year. Um, there's a mixture between lectures and seminars, and if you're in a lecture, you'll be in a lecture with uh, all the other students on the module. So that could be in some of the big lectures, up to 120 students. But you'll also always also have at least one hour, possibly two hours of seminar time when you're in a group of um, 20 students uh, in the first year. In the second year, that, make, that gets slightly smaller, so we try to get the groups down to about 15. Um, and in the third year, you're then working in specialised groups where the groups can be around 10, 10 to 12, that kind of, um, that kind of number, really. OK. Excellent. We're going to pop over to Karina now in drama. Um, I'm sure a lot of people interested in your course are uh, wondering about the opportunities to get involved in local theatres um, in the local area. So can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, there's a, an, a lot of opportunities out there in Oxford to get involved in local and student theatre. So we currently have students who work with the 1622 company at the Oxford Playhouse um, under construction theatre company or a site-specific performance devised company um, and our own in-house reconception theatre company. And as well as that, there are lots of other student societies and students create their own performances. So. Excellent. And can you uh, build on what uh, Daniel was saying and talk about um, the weekly life of a drama student, please? 
Um, in many respects, they're very similar to an English student. Um, Brooks cleverly manages the system so the workloads are balanced out. Drama students are always combined honours with another subject. So it means that your drama and your other subject will be perfectly balanced. That said, you can expect to spend quite a bit of time working with your performance groups, working in rehearsals every single week. So you might have between 10 or 12 hours contact time, but you would also spend quite a lot of other time in rehearsals as well. Okay. Um, you spoke about how varied the course can be, uh, but can you talk about in terms of students being able to specialise in certain different pathways? Yeah, there aren't specific pathways, but there's lots of scope for specialisation. Um, we have two primary areas, which is early modern theatre, so Shakespeare and his contemporaries, and um, contemporary and modern performance. Um, within that, there's lots of scope to pursue your own interests, um, and modules allow our students to tailor things to suit themselves. The final production module is one where you can basically choose your own project and work on it for a semester and perform it for credit. Um, there's a dissertation module and there's an independent study module, so there's quite a lot of scope for flexibility. Excellent. Uh, we've received a question and it's for applied languages, so we're going to pop over to Irene over there. Yep. Um, can you talk to us about the timetable, a typical timetable for a student studying applied languages as our <laughs> sign falls down? <laughs> um, well, it will be similar to the uh, example from English and drama in the sense that students will be expected to take four modules each semester. Um, and then it'll be a sort of timetable between 10 to 12 hours contact. For languages, uh, depending on which language you choose to do, you would do between three to four hours per week for that language. And then for the specialism you choose, whether it's business or international relation or, or education, for instance, uh, you will have contact hours per module of two hours per week. But students must remember that there's a lot of homework to be done outside the class and so for a credit module for instance at Brooks they estimate between 114 hours self-study time okay. so we directed self-study time. Um, you mentioned that um, <coughs> excuse me how little contact hours um, you have typically and I'm sure it's the same for a lot of the yeah. other subjects so um, what would you say to someone uh, what support is offered outside of those contact times well we do have a virtual environment <coughs> where we do put a lot of resources and a lot of things to prepare before the student comes to class so that's where we expect the student to log on every day to check what work is to be done and prepared so that the session, whether it's a seminar or lecture, is fully effective. Excellent. Um, and a final question for you for the moment. How does the Applied Language BA differ from other combined courses? Um, well, generally, other combined courses only combine one language with a subject. And depending on the university, it can be quite disjointed. Uh, program. While the applied languages has been designed as a single honour, so all the topic and subject areas are merged together and working in tandem. So we're asking students to choose two languages rather than one. One is post A level, the other one can be from beginners, and a specialism. And right from day one, we will work with the student to actually work towards the year abroad or the placement year in year three combining and merging the, the three subjects together, the two languages and the specialism. Excellent. Thank you very much. Keeping the language theme going, we're going to pop over to French studies now. Um, so, Barbara, which companies do you use for your work placements on your course? Yes, we have, we're working on a regular basis. We have a set of, of uh, database of companies uh, that we use every, every year or so. Uh, a lot of students uh, go to Paris mainly, where we have a few companies there, such as Alcatel, GoFluent, so Alcatel being a, a, a communication uh, company, GoFluent, which is a distance learning, distance English learning company, uh, which offers several uh, uh, work placements, actually. Um, 
We are also working with a car hiring company in Antibes, so it's slightly different, but the, 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 um, the, the location is in the south of France, so it's quite appealing to some of our <laughs> students. Uh, Eurosport as well in, in Paris, uh, BBC as well, so it's very varied, uh, and it also depends on what the students want, and, and also it depends on, s on on what they find because we provide a set of companies that the students can choose from but also some students find their own companies and we also welcome uh, any suggestion and we are happy to to make contact with the the, the company that the students have found and sometimes it, it works I mean all the times really it, wor it works really well uh, okay. so we are open to any suggestions that the students you name um, some specific yes. uh, destinations there, but can you um, do a work placement anywhere where they speak the target language, or are there some limitations? Um, the limitation will be the Erasmus grant, really, because students going on the Euro abroad can can get the uh, Erasmus funding. So, is they st if they stay, you know, within Europe and France specifically, should they choose to go to a, a francophone country such as Canada or? Uh, you know, um, Northern Africa, or they would not benefit from the Erasmus funding. So that's the only, uh, you know, negative aspect. But you know, we have no reasons to to uh, reject these offers. Yeah. Excellent. Good thing to bear in mind there. Um, hopping over to speaking of years abroad to Japanese studies. Um, talk to us about the when students go to study in Japan. At what point of their course will they? Um, it would be in the that. third year. In their third year. And whereabouts um, in Japan do they end up? Well, uh, we currently have 16 partner universities that are scattered all over Japan. So they could be in big cities like Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto or Nagoya. And then in the provinces, we have partner universities in Ibaraki, um, Kyushu, uh, which is to the south, and to Yamanashi, where about uh, Mount Fuji is. Excellent, brilliant, very exciting indeed. Um, an open question for um, all the uh, language students, um, as this just struggles to load. Um, typically, what does the, um, away from your placements in your year abroad, your day-to-day -day lives in the language uh, departments, learning a language, um, what, sort, what typical uh, means of assessment do you um, use for your students? Shall I start? Okay, so in, in, it's mainly coursework that we use, especially in language, uh, in language lessons, in language um, uh, modules. Uh, the reason being that uh, learning a language, and it's the same in Japanese, I know learning a language requires consistent uh, work uh, and a regular work. So it, there is a weekly assessment, a weekly kind of uh, assessment. Then there are in-class tests tests so like reading comprehension listening comprehension so it's scattered throughout the semester uh, and only at the end of the um, the, the year uh, the academic year would the students have an exam in la in the language uh, uh, module okay. but otherwise it's coursework and it's really regular Okay. Uh, There's some nodding going next to you. Is it similar yes. in Japanese? It, it is quite similar. Um, our courses, uh, many of them run by semesters, so we would have a final exam at the end of the semester, and the uh, proportion would be 70% um, coursework mm -hmm. and 30% yes. um, final exam, or 60, 40, a proportion mm -hmm. of that kind. Mm -hmm. Yes. We've received a question in, and I believe it's for English, so for Daniel. And the question is, how much contact teaching time would I get with the English department if I'm taking a combined honours course? Okay. <coughs> Basically, you're, you're splitting the, the hours that you've got between two subjects. So normally, if you are, you're doing uh, four subjects in one semester in your English course, you're also doing four subjects, uh, or rather four subjects, in the other subjects across the whole year. So normally you're doing per semester, you're doing two subjects, two modules in one subject and two modules in the other. So you're basically splitting it in half. So you're, you're looking at maybe six to eight hours of contact time if you're doing a combined course. It depends what you then choose to do with your modules. You might want to take more optional modules in English, which will increase your English time. But as a, as a rough rule, probably six to eight hours is, is what you're likely to get in terms of, in terms of contact hours on a combined course. 
Brilliant. Uh, we'll hop from the English ac- academic to the English student. Shell, uh, on the end there, can you talk to us about your experience doing undergraduate English? Um, whether there was much group work or whether it was largely individual, the work you did? Um, it was a bit of a mix, really. Um, a lot of English, obviously, is independent work. Uh, you get a lot of time out of the classroom where you're reading and so on. Um, so you have some assessments which are done in groups. So you might do maybe some, um, some poster work. Um, I took a publishing module as part of mine, so there was a section of that where we, we worked together as a group. Um, so th- there is a bit of a mix, but uh, a lot of it is kind of independent work. However, obviously, if you want to work in groups, there is kind of you know, some scope for that as well. Um, you'll also, I mean, you'll also always do in in um, in the English modules. You'll al- always do presentations within classes, uh, and that's sometimes individual presentations where you're asked to talk for about ten minutes mm-hmm. on a particular subject you can specify, or You'll also do group presentations where you're with either one, one other person or two other people. And part of that is to try and encourage you to work together as a team, which is which is a very important life skill, which is something that, that we're here to try and encourage you to do. Um, so at lots of different stages, you'll be doing presentations, but often in, as part of a teaching tool is that what, what we'll do in, in class, in a seminar, for instance, is to have small group work where you'd be asked to look at something for 10 minutes together as a group, report back to the group have a sort of short debate, that kind of thing. It's a way of, of, of just sort of making sure that the students' voices are heard rather than the, just the, the lecturers. Excellent. So just while we're um, chatting about your student experience, how easy was it throughout your undergraduate course to specialise in areas that you wanted to study? Yeah, um, really easy, actually. Um, so when you select your modules, um, you obviously you, you get an option in front of you of kind of different areas so I'm particularly interested in the early modern period so for me um, I was able to kind of go through have a look at writers I was interested in or time periods and particularly as you go further through your degree the um, the modules become more and more uh, kind of specialised and uh, there's a really good range of the departments we've got a really good range of academics f- across all sorts of areas of, um, of English literature um, and drama, of course, as well. So it's it's quite easy to pick a path that you want to go down as you find your own interests. And how easy was it, uh, from your experience, bear in mind the one sat next to me, was it to <laughs> uh, contact your lecturers when you needed them most? Very easy. It's, it's very, no, it was actually really easy. <laughs> Not just because I'm under pressure. No, it was really, really easy. Um, it, you know, I, I kind of, you, you can send an email if that's easiest for you. Um, you can easily pop to... Uh, you know your supervisor or your lecturer's um, office they have set office hours which are really fairly advertised so you always know kind of when you can go and approach them um, or I say if emailing is easier then you can do that for, for a response as well so excellent um, popping back to drama um, away from their course is there a drama society that students can get involved in yes in fact there are several under the um, broad umbrella of the Fortune Players Society and there's the Drama Critics, Drama Appreciation Society as well. And are they, um, being involved in them, does that actively improve their experience uh, in terms of their degree? Yeah, um, I guess our students would say yes because (laughs) they're enthusiastic joiners of the Fortune Players, particularly the musical arm I think. So yeah, lots of scopes do different kinds of theatre. And if you're technically minded, there's a lighting and sound society too. So I shouldn't forget that. Mm. It's also worth saying, I mean, (coughs) Queen might might say more about this, that Oxford is a fantastic place to study drama because of all the resources that are are available in the city. You know, not just in the city, we're an hour from London, you know, an hour from Stratford. It works pretty well in terms of actually getting to theatre, seeing lots of theatre outside of class time but also kind of um, we often have um, directors and practitioners who will come in and work with the students yeah. don't we? Yeah we, we work with theatre professionals often we bring in theatre directors um, people who run their own theatre company people who work devising theatre and we bring them in too and so part of your degree would actually be working with people who are professionally making theatre out there now so you can learn just not just from your lecturers, but also from people who earn their living making theatre. We've had a question in for uh, drama, and it is, do I need to have lots of acting experience in order to study drama? The simple answer is, no, you do not. Um, if you've got some, that's absolutely great. 
What you really should feel comfortable doing, though, is feeling okay about doing group practical performance work, because you'll do quite a bit of it. Excellent. Um, a similar sort of question I'll direct it to Irene first, but it's a languages question. Um, what sort of ability out of languages do students need to have before considering a language degree? <coughs> Uh, whether they choose uh, uh, French or applied languages, they need one language uh, relevant um, to the course post A level, mm -hmm. um, okay. grade B or A. Um, otherwise, the second language on applied languages can be from beginners, and our Japanese program is from beginners or post beginners. Um, but for the Japanese, because it's not as widely taught in school, some people might have. Uh, had some experience in Japanese language, so what we do at Brooks is that we do a test on entry and then see which group is the most appropriate for them. Okay. Um, can you just build on that? How do you deal in Japanese with students who start their degree with different levels of ability in Japanese? How do you deal with... Um, well, like Irene said, uh, we do a placement test, okay. so if the student has enough um, level to skip one year, uh, we would uh, suggest uh, that student to join the second year. And if they have enough level to jump two years, then we would suggest the third year course. Okay, brilliant. Um, another just broad language question, maybe Barbie could mm -hmm. have a go at answering mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, can you learn another language just for fun on top of your uh, this chosen language and what languages would be available? Yes, there is the possibility to add uh, a ninth module uh, per year, uh, which is free actually, uh, as long as it's a language module. And the languages on offer are Mandarin, Japanese, German, I think, uh, and Spanish. And as French. Well, and French, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite, quite a wide range of, of Lots languages. Of options. Yes. We mentioned, Dan mentioned um, the city of Oxford. It's a huge, um, big uh, appeal of Oxford Brooks that it is in the wonderful city, I'm biased, mm -hmm. but the wonderful mm -hmm. city of Oxford. From a languages perspective, how good a city is it to learn languages in? Well, first of all, Oxford is very cosmopolitan, so you are in touch with uh, um, students from all over the, the world, you know, it's, and it's, uh, there's loads of uh, societies as well. Uh, in, in Oxford there is uh, uh, the Maison Française, which offers conferences, which has a library, uh, which helps students with their um, uh, studies, and which also sometimes put in touch students, French students, and, and uh, English students together. Uh, at Brooks, we have a French society as well, which is quite active, uh, organizing trips to Paris, Brussels, etc. Uh, but in general, no, Oxford is a is really, really good place to, uh, to learn about other cultures and languages as well, and French, I'm sure. Yes, yeah, so and, and Japanese for Japanese studies too. Um, there are a lot of <coughs> Japanese exchange students in Oxford, so our students have a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. for language exchange. And then at the University of Oxford, uh, we have the uh, Nissan Institute, which um, specializes in social studies, and they organize seminar series each semester to which we can go and listen. And um, it's, it's a perfect environment for studying Japanese, actually. Excellent. From the student's perspective, how good is Oxford to, as a place to live while you're a student? Yeah, um, it's, it's great. It's a lovely city. Uh, I'm from Oxford originally anyway, so it, if I was, it wasn't a huge transition for me. Um, but I, I lived in student accommodation uh, to begin with during my, uh, during my undergrad, and it's a lovely city. It's really pretty um, all the time, even when the weather's bad. Um, <laughs> and um, there's just so much going on. It's, it's really busy. Um, I'm really into kind of in, into history and obviously early modern English. So there's a lot of museums. There's lots of really interesting architecture and things like that. So it's good from that perspective. If you're more into um, so if, and for theatre, we've got two big theatres in Oxford and some smaller ones. Um, th there's just there's loads of things happening, and with two big universities in the city as well, there's always a lot of students going around. So there's a lot of scope for making friends and connections and stuff. So it's, yeah, it's lovely. Um, time's uh, moving on very quickly. We've received another question, so we're going to move our attention to careers and life after um, the uh, undergraduate degree. And the question here, which I'm going to direct first to Daniel, but please do chip in from um, other courses, is what help does the department offer with regard to future careers? Okay, well, part of the purpose of, of your undergraduate degree should be about 
the exploration of your subject. That's primarily what you're here to do, which is to have to take three years to explore your subject. This is the last, last chance for many people that they'll get to really study a subject. So what we primarily want you to do is explore that, you know, be, live in the moment, enjoy what you're doing, whichever subject it is you choose to do. But obviously, you know and we know that three years down the line you're going to need to, to be to be working so what we're always trying to do is to show you the ways in which the skills that you are you are practicing are transferable to particular professions um, that that you are able to in some ways be be aware of how you can use those skills wherever it takes you to go for a subject like English or drama particularly which are non-vocational subjects and as, I guess to some extent for languages as well that there's non non specifically vocational the, the, there is a sense in using the skills that are transferable. So what we'll be trying to do uh, for you is to direct you to ways in which you can understand how skills like critical thinking or reasoning or the use of the creative imagination are, are transferable to lots of different careers. At the same time, what you're also getting is the, the full use of the, the career centre at, at the university, um, which is very not, not only kind of very... Uh, helpful it's actually very proactive it will go out and find you and it will, uh, will will talk to you about the ways in which you can get into certain professions certain internships certain opportunities that you might take up as part of the work uh, placement modules that we have um, one of the things that, that we run as a department is every year is to have a, uh, a careers evening where we invite back our uh, alumni students who have previously been with us and have graduated and have gone to careers they come back to you and uh, they come back to us and they talk about how they got into their careers, how they, they, um, how they used the, their subjects in order to get them into careers. So all the way along the line, it is a balance between these are the skills you need for your subject and these are the skills you need to take you into the rest of your, your working life. So we hope that there's a, there's a, a good balance there. And we, you know, we're not blind to the fact that actually you are going somewhere and you, you need your career. Yeah. And yeah. In, in French we run, uh, for the final year students throughout the year, employability workshops. So people from career come and make presentations on how, to, do, how to, to, to write a good CV, a good letter of application, and how to find uh, jobs on the continent as well, not only in England but also in France or wherever they would like to go afterwards. So, uh, and, and we do uh, run uh, workshops on, um, first of all, how to reflect on the year abroad and uh, even if it was not a work placement, but there are loads of skills that were developed there. So we help the students to really reflect on the transferable skills that they have acquired. Uh, so there is a, a real uh, engagement uh, to uh, help the students to really uh, focus on their skills yeah. after graduating. Because oh. Sorry, it's worth pointing out as well, the careers um, service generally, that Daniel mentioned there, <coughs> is available for your time as a student and then mm -hmm. for three further years completely yes. for free mm -hmm. after you graduate. It's a remarkably good service. So please bear that in mind. It doesn't, you don't just lose that uh, once you graduate. Sorry, yes, when it comes to interview, very often, you know, people are confident to say they, their ability to work in teams, but what the interviewer won't want is actually examples. So mm -hmm. it's training the student to actually see, reflect on their experience and realise where they can really claim to have got that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're very focused on that. Mm -hmm. The other thing worth mentioning is, is that the, uh, all programmes have a, a work placement module. Do you want to talk about drama? Yeah, I mean, obviously for, for some drama students, um, graduation is, is more vocational. It's, it's, for some of our students, they've gone straight out into acting jobs. Others have gone on to one year short conservatoire acting courses so we we currently have uh, a recent graduate who's at RADA studying a master's in acting for example um, and one of the ways that we help our students really prepare for those is through the professional theatre practice sessions and with plenty of um, opportunities to really sculpt your own performance likes and dislikes so doing the final production for example and doing the second year um, British theatre and performance modules are really great ways to get a taster of the experience of putting your own performance together from lighting and sound directing and acting all combined 
Excellent. We have about a minute to go, so I thought we'd end. Cheryl, if you could tell us what the your favourite thing about <laughs> your time <laughs> at Oxford Brooks is. I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah. As a student, what's your, been your favourite thing about being at Oxford Brooks? Oh, um, so many things. Um, <laughs> that sounds really cool. So it's really good here. It's, it's lovely. Um, I think probably just the, the community within uh, the department has just been amazing for me. It's really nice. Um, not just amongst the students, but um, kind of the staff as well. You know, people just really go out of their way to help you, and it's just a really, it's a really nice atmosphere. You do feel kind of at home, which is why I'm, I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a now. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you very much for watching and for contributing your questions, and thank you also to the academics and to the student for joining us today. If your question didn't get answered, or if you'd like more information on any of the things we've been talking about, then you can email us, and the email address is english slash languages at brooks.ac.uk. You can also visit our website, brooks.ac.uk, for more information. The admissions chat is open for another 15 minutes, so please get your questions through to them, and please do take the virtual tour. But other than that, we hope this has been useful. We thank you again for tuning in, and we look forward to actually seeing you very soon. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.